old uh, joke that probably goes back to David Hilbert's time, uh, that in uh, work on the foundations of mathematics, a formalist is a mathematician who can't understand anything unless it has no meaning. Uh, well, what I want to do today is uh, uh, show you formalization of certain natural language things, very simple ones. Uh, when you see the formalization, uh, you, you would naturally say, well, goodness, I didn't say that. But uh, this is trying to, to capture the, the full semantics of it and make the distinctions that we mentally make ordinarily without actually being aware of it much of the time. I'm going to try and spell it out. It looks a bit formidable. But I'll try, uh, if, it, if it gets too bad, uh, I'll just stop. So, okay. You don't really need to know for these problems how it's picking the object out. You just know that it can pick out different objects under different circumstances. And so we can suppress some of the, the machinery. Uh, and as far as Alice goes, uh, Alice is a rigid designator. It's, it's not a different person from time to time. So how do we handle that? All right, so what I want to do is give a formal language in which the machinery for this can be expressed. Uh, it'll be a language of modal logic because we're talking about under different circumstances. Um, the, the thing is, the language won't exactly be propositional. Uh, you need more than that. It won't exactly be first order either. We don't have quantifiers. I just said that's, that's more than we'll actually need. So it'll be something in between, and I'll say some more about that in a few minutes. But you'll see. Okay. The syntax is not enough. Of course, you need a semantics to go with it. And so I'll show you the semantics. Uh, I don't think there'll be time to discuss proof systems. Uh, this, is, this is actually from uh, a, a paper that hasn't been published yet. Uh, Professor Robert Barik is, uh, is 75, and they're having a, a, a volume honoring him. And this is a paper for that volume. Uh, it hasn't been published yet, and I, I don't think he's seen it yet. So uh, don't tell him if you run into it. Um, uh, but uh, if there is time, I'll say something about this. OK, so King of Sweden picks up different people at different times. But it, it, it also is partial. There are times when there is no king. It doesn't pick out any time. The definite description says how this picking out is done. But that's more than we need. We just need that it, it does this. Um, so a modal language, I want to use relation symbols, which means, of course, we have to have uh, variables or terms or something like that for the relation symbol to apply to. Uh, but we won't need quantifiers. So uh, we're still speaking informally. I'll give you a formal syntax in a little while. But what t of x, y informally mean person x is taller than person y? 
So it's not true if X is not a person. Uh, it's not true if X and Y are persons, but uh, X is shorter than Y. Uh, I understand I'm, I'm blurring things together here. Informally mean, you'd have to say what I'm doing here is explaining the interpretation of T. Uh, and person X and person Y, well, they're variables, but we're working under an implicit valuation of values assigned to these variables. All of that's kind of suppressed here. Uh, box X, uh, well, for the time being, let's give it a, a temporal reading. Uh, let it informally mean X is true at all future times. Uh, if diamond is not box not, then this means X is true at some future time. Uh, and we don't need to go into much detail about what time is like, uh, uh, discrete, uh, continuous, or anything like that. It, it really plays no role. Uh, so let M, uh, think of M as a constant symbol, uh, non-rigidly designate the king of Sweden, or perhaps nobody at all. Uh, so at different times, M designates a different person, and there are times when M doesn't designate. Um, we want to say that at some future, M designates someone taller than the person M designates now. Uh, well. It's possible that, well, T of M, M, that, that certainly can't be correct. Um, see, the, the, the problem is one of scope. In this possible T of M, M, the second M should be outside the diamond and the first uh, M inside. Uh, the, uh, the, the second one is outside uh, the diamond. You're talking about what M designates now. If the first M is inside the diamond, it's what M designates at some possible future. And there's no, uh, there's nothing in the machinery, the syntactic machinery, to make that distinction. It's one we do when, in, when we talk, but people understand what we're saying. Uh, so, predicate abstraction. Uh, what I want to do is introduce a scoping mechanism. Uh, so, what we're doing is taking uh, uh, well, all right, here. Phi is a formula. Uh, C is a non rigid constant symbol. And we'll make this more general in a little while. Uh, X is a variable. And I want to think of this as being true in a possible world if the formula phi is true there, when you assign to X as its value whatever it is that C designates there. And is that reasonably clear? I mean, C designates different things at different worlds. Give x the value that C designates. Now, you notice there's, there's a type distinction here. Uh, C is non-rigid. What C designates at a particular world is no longer non-rigid. It's a particular object. So the x here is not really the same type of thing as the C. Uh, if C doesn't designate it a world, we have to decide what to do, and we'll just take the abstract to be false. Uh, you're saying uh, you can't assign uh, a, a property to a thing if you don't have the thing. There, there are various ways of handling that. The one, one plausible way uh, is uh, if C doesn't designate, the thing could have no truth value. But then you get into uh, a multiple value logic, and there are several of those, and there's no particular good reason for choosing one over another. So let's just say this is false. If it doesn't so here's a formulation of uh, someday the monarch will be taller than now uh, with this abstraction machinery in here. Uh, uh, notice this M it, it goes with that Y. Uh, and that puts it outside the modal operator. This M goes with the X, and that puts it inside the modal operator. So you've, you've, got, the, uh, you've got the scoping machinery here. Um, actually, if you look at uh, Russell's treatment of definite descriptions, uh, not the one in on denoting, but the one in the second edition of Brinkipia, uh, he has this scoping mechanism there. The, the, the notation is different, it's more complicated, but it's explicitly there. And then as quickly as possible, he, he proves that, uh, oh, if something is rigid, the scope doesn't matter, 
um, under certain circumstances, uh, you can take it to be wide scope. And so he starts leaving the, uh, the, the notation indicating scope out. But it's there, of course, because definite descriptions, when you translate them away, you introduce existential quantifiers, and they have scopes. But, so th this has been there all along. Um, and it's really the scope machinery that's, that's the heart of the matter. Uh, now, so what this is saying is it's true of the present king, that's the value of y, which gets what it m uh, uh, designates at the moment that at some possible future, that's the diamond, so I'm reading this from outside in, the taller than predicate will hold between the king then, that's the value of x, which uh, where x gets assigned what m designates when you move to a possible alternate world, uh, and the present king. So it's true of the present king that at some possible future, the taller than predicate will hold between the king then and the present king. Now, Again, this is still informal, but I will give you a formal syntax in a few minutes that actually gives it this reading. Uh, Alice. Okay. There are different kings of Sweden at different times. Uh, these are separate problems because so far none of the kings have been named Alice. Uh, but Alice is a proper name. And names are generally taken to be rigid designators, so you can't say the Alice at some other uh, in other, some other state compared to the Alice now, they're the same Alice. So what we are saying is something like Alice could be taller than herself. Um, well, so if, if we formalized it the same way we just did, it would turn into this. Uh, it, it's simply I put A's where I had M's. But the, the trouble is, if A is rigid, this is true. Now, uh, I haven't told you how to interpret the equality symbol, but simply interpret it to be a equality between objects at a level. Um, so what's this saying? Uh, the value of y, what Alice designates now, is necessarily, necessarily has this property, that it is equal to the value of a, that's, that's the x, at some other world, at all world. So it's saying what A designates now is equal to what A designates at any accessible world. If A is rigid, that's, that's the case. Um, and once I give you the semantics, uh, it will be very easy to see that from these two, this is a logical consequence. And that's simply saying that Alice is possibly taller than herself. You don't really want me to say it quite that way. Um, so we need something else here. This one is still. So, uh, a, a solution to this kind of problem, Alice is a rigid designator, same in all possible ways, but her inessential <coughs> properties can vary, um, like height. Uh, presumably, you're the same person now that you were when you were 10 years old, but your height is not the same. So, suppose we have a fungal technique <coughs> mapping a person to a height. And before the, the T predicate, we didn't really have to care what a height was. We just had to be able to compare them. Now let's say a height is a number. Uh, so even if A is rigid, what H assigns to A can vary from world to world because H doesn't have to be rigid. Okay, the, so the A is a rigid constant, but the H doesn't have to be a rigid function. It can assign different values to a constant at, at different, uh, under different circumstances. So the thing is, attributes can change while the individuals who have the attributes remain fixed. So this is a first draft of uh, modeling that. So take key to be a greater than predicate and think of heights as numbers. Um, evaluate the y is you evaluate h of a now, then you move to an alternative world, you evaluate the h of a there, that's x, and uh, if this is correct, uh, uh, Alice's height at that alternate world should be in the greater than relation to Alice's height in the present. So it's more machinery, but uh, I don't know how else to handle it. But, uh, so we need a proper formalization. And then this was an oversimplification. Uh, so we'll see what else we need. Uh, so proper formalization. Uh, assume we have objects and, well, it's a proper formalization.
formalization. I'm still being informal. We have the things we actually bump into. People, numbers, that's a kind of a soft one. Uh, things of that nature. Uh, and intentions, non-rigid designators, definite descriptions, my best friend, the world's tallest people. The idea is intentions pick out objects under different circumstances. So the language we're using, uh, this is a simplified version. Uh, one can have more complicated versions, and I'll say in what way a little later. Uh, but so we have object variables. These are used the way I did before. They take as values objects. Uh, intention constants. Uh, these are non-rigid and pick out different objects under different circumstances. Intention function symbols. Um, relation symbols. Okay, uh, it, it's often convenient to think of uh, intention constants as zero-place intention function symbols. They just don't take arguments. So uh, that makes, means you don't have to give separate rules for the two of them. There's just one set of rules. So intention terms, uh, intention function symbol applied to a bunch of things, atomic formulas, relation symbol applied to a bunch of things. But you notice, here, there's no nesting. They're really applied to variables, and that's all. And variables will be given objects as values. So the intention term, uh, uh, intention function, applied to objects. When I said this could be made more complicated, yes, you could have intention terms applied to intention terms. Uh, atomic formulas, uh, relation of objects. These are variables. You could have a more complicated, you could have uh, a relation implied to objects and intentions. But this is all we need for what we're talking about now. So again, only variables here. Uh, why? Uh, because there, if you don't do something like this, ambiguities come up. There are some natural abbreviations, but those abbreviations only cover some cases. You'll see examples in a few minutes. So, Definition of formula, much of it is uh, routine. Atomic formulas are formulas. Formulas are closed under logical connectives. Uh, box and diamond can apply to formulas. Uh, and this abstraction thing, if X is, capital X is a formula, little x is an object variable, and T is an intention function term, then this thing is a formula. Uh, think of it as uh, the predicate abstracted from capital X holds of T means holds of what T designates. The definition of free variable occurrences, because we do have variables here, it's the usual one, together with, in this abstract here, uh, the free variable occurrences are whatever are free in phi, except for occurrences of x, but together with free variable occurrences in T. So this uh, lambda abstract acts like a, a binary. Uh, so, here, P of A is not legal, where A is an intention constant. You need variables there. But you can think of it as an abbreviation for, for this. The predicate abstracted from P applies to <coughs> But what about something like this? Diamond, diamond, P of A. Uh, it could be any of these. Uh, the predicate abstracted from diamond, diamond, P of X, or the predicate abstracted from diamond P of X, or the predicate abstracted from P of X. And these, are, these all behave differently. Uh, for, for this one, uh, P of A, there's only one natural meaning you could have, and it's that. And you could say, well, let's abbreviate that by the, the thing up, up there. But these are really different. And I don't want to introduce diamond, diamond, P of A, because there's no natural one of these to choose it to mean. So this is one of the reasons I am not allowing intention terms to turn up in uh, uh, atomic formulas. No, yes, they don't mean the same thing, not at all. I didn't allow function nesting. Uh, well, you can accomplish it by taking P of F of G of A to uh, 
as short for this. Now, this one is, looks a bit of a mess, but what you're saying here is this predicate forms of x. I'm sorry, I'm getting dots on the board here. I should have lowered my hands. So you just uh, push clear there. It, 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 I assume it'll go away in a minute. Or no, push no. Clear. Yeah. You push clear. Push clear. Okay, is that clear? Yeah. All right. Um, so the the the, the uh, predicate p holds of and x gets as its value uh, this, which is f applied to y, which gets as its value this, which is g applied to z, which gets as its value a. So all of these are evaluated at the world you're at. And that top thing is a natural abbreviation to the, the bottom thing. But you have the same kind of problem you had before. Uh, these three all behave differently, uh, where f and a are not rigid. And so again, um, diamond p of f of a is seriously ambiguous, and I just don't want it. So, uh, it's one of these is a kind of broad scope, one of these is a kind of narrow scope, and one of these is really somewhere in between. So rather than having to pay attention to which one are we doing at the moment, we just won't have them. All right, so the semantics here. Uh, I assume you're all familiar with Kripke semantics. Uh, all right, so this is a model. This is going to be the set of possible worlds. This will be the accessibility relation in the usual way. Uh, and this will be an object domain. Now, you, you, have a, you have two possible ways you could go here. You could have one object domain, which is the same for all of the possible worlds, or you could have a varying domain kind of semantics where each possible world has its own domain. Um, the thing is, if you have a single object domain uh, for that all the worlds share, this is sometimes called possibilist semantics, uh, you can simulate the others by having uh, an existence predicate, which is supposed to be true at the world of the things that actually exist there, and then relativize things to that existence predicate. So by picking a single object domain, I'm not losing any generality, but I'm considerably simplifying the, uh, the semantics. Uh, and then finally, an interpretation function, which tells you how the what the meaning of the various symbols is supposed to be. And that's what we need to concentrate on. So for each n-place relation symbol, p, the interpretation of p is a function from g to p of d n. But what, what is all of that saying? Uh, the, the interpretation of, a, of an n-place relation symbol should be a something that assigns to each world. And this is really some n-place relation. N-place relation thought of as a set of entities over the domain. So the interpretation of a relation symbol is a relation, but it can it depends on what world you're in. Uh, oh, sorry. The, the equality symbol, I'm assuming, is uh, rigid and then simply maps to the equality relation everywhere. Uh, for any n-place function symbol, this one is a little more complicated. The interpretation of a function symbol to be a mapping. For the moment, think of this as the set of worlds. So it should map the set of worlds and an n tuple to an object. So okay, it should just, it should assign to this function symbol at a world uh, an binary function. But uh, I want to allow these things to not designate some worlds, like the King of Sweden. So uh, it's not really defined on the entire of G. Each one of these is defined on some subset of G, and it can vary with the function set. So think of the S here as where the function symbol F designates something. Okay? Now, we need the notion of evaluation. We want to assign values to variables. So evaluation B just maps variables to members of the domain, assigns objects to variables. And this is what we still need to define, the notion of truth. So uh, in model M, at world W, 
formula phi is true with respect to valuation B. So M is the model, W is the world you're evaluating things at, it's formula phi you're evaluating, and V tells you how to understand the uh, free variables. Uh, okay, so this is what I just said. So, all right, so most of this is pretty straightforward. Uh, in fact, all of this is pretty straightforward. I've left out the one that isn't. Uh, for the atomic case, since we only allow variables here, this uh, is to be true at world W if the integral consisting of the values you've assigned to this is in the meaning you've assigned to the relation symbol at this world. Remember, that's some actual relation. So the relation you've associated with this symbol at W should have these things in it for this to be true. Um, propositional connectors just behave truth functionally at each world, and I just gave the prize as an example. X implies Y is true in the world if X isn't or Y is. Necessity is the usual thing. Box X is true at W, just in case X is true at W prime for all accessible W prime. And the valuation stays the same, and possibility is the same idea. Uh, this is the, uh, the serious one. Uh, look at the bottom one first. Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm interested in when is this true? So at world W, under valuation V, this abstract should hold a function symbol A applied to these things. Now, this bottom one here, if A doesn't designate, we just take it to be false. Now, if A does designate, uh, well, we have to figure out what it is that's being designated. You're, if A does designate, then this actually uh, associates, the, your interpretation of A actually associates a function with A at world W. Apply that function to the values associated with these variables. That gives you something. Change the valuation here to be one that associates with W uh, what, what that is. So this is the, the, the heart of it. So this should be true if this is true with respect to a different valuation that's like the original one, except that it assigns to y the thing you're abstracting over. What this thing designates at that level. And to get that, you have to see what function was associated with a and apply it to the values of these things. Because everybody got this one. This is the key thing. Does anybody have this thing? Two thirds of you. Which two thirds? Okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry again. Uh, as a special case, uh, that was where A uh, was an n array function. Suppose A is a zero array function, in other words, a constant. This is what the whole thing reduces to. Uh, if A designates at the world, this is true. If uh, this is true, using a valuation that's like the original one, except you've associated with the variable you're abstracting over, whatever it is that A designates at that world. And if A doesn't designate, then it's just false. So it's easier to see it in this context, whether you don't have the variables as input. It's the same idea. So let's look at some examples. Someday the king of Sweden might be taller than now. This is what I formalized this way before. And I want to just show you uh, in a quirky model that it behaves the way you'd expect it to behave. I had some fun with this. Um, so let's see. The oldest known reference to a king of Sweden is in Tacitus around the year 100. So let's assume that in the year 50 there was no king of Sweden. Uh, there was a King Magnus III Barnlock who died in 1290. And as the result of excavating a, a cemetery of male Swedish skeletons from about that time, they came up with an average height of 174.3 centimeters. So let's assume this king was average. All right. 
Uh, the current king of Sweden, uh, Carl XVI Gustav, is 179 centimeters tall, and it's astounding how easy it is to find that fact on the internet. <laughs> I don't know why. All right, so let's set up a model here. There are three states. That's supposed to be the world in the year 50, the world in the year 1289, and the world in the year current year. Um, so there are three years represented. Uh, there are, the domain consists of those two kings, Magnus and Carl Gustav. Um, so it's, it's a constant domain that all the worlds have. Uh, the interpretation of M, the, 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 the monarch, the king of Sweden, is not defined for the year 50. Uh, in this year, it's interpreted to be Magnus, and in this year, it's interpreted to be Carl Gustav. So it's longer. So this is what I'm telling you here. Um, let's see. Oh, I, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I told you what I was going to tell you. This is, so, uh, I'm giving you the interpretation of uh, of T. That is supposed to be the Torah of the And in fact, I'm interpreting it rigidly the way you're using taller in the year 50 is the same as in 1289, is the same as here. This guy is taller than this guy. So it's interpreted rigidly. Uh, you know, but you notice, by the way, uh, this is a possibilist uh, semantics. You can talk about these things in the year 50 if you knew enough to talk about them, even though they don't exist in the year 50. Uh, all right, so this is the formula I showed you before. I want to verify that it's true in the year 1289. The valuation doesn't really matter because there aren't any true variables here. Uh, okay, so the claim is this is true. Now, uh, why? Well, this has the form of an abstract. So what you should do is figure out what M designates under these circumstances, and that becomes the value of Y. All right, so this is true because this is true, the, the inner thing here, under evaluation that's like the original one, except you see how you're interpreting monarch of in that year, and in fact, it's Magnus. So this is true, if this is true, where d prime of y is Magnus. Now, just to make things simpler, I'm going to uh, do something slightly illegal and put this in in place of the y there because it simplifies the notation. But understand it's a short. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to write it like this. So the original thing holds if this holds uh, where what was here is being assigned max. All right, that's true uh, because let's see, uh, this is a diamond. So you have to move to an alternate, alternate world. In 1289, there is only one future world I show in this model. So it has to be because this, without the diamond, is true in uh, 2014. So we have to verify that that's true. Uh, and for this to be true, you have to see what M designates, and that becomes the value of X. So you have a different valuation in which you assign to X what M designates in 2014, and that's Carl Wilson. And again, I'm going to do the same thing. I'll just put that in where the X is. So it comes down to the original thing holds if this holds. And uh, it does, because I set my interpretation of T to be this at all the worlds. So it's exactly what you'd expect. It's just showing you that the formal machinery does actually do what you want it to. Uh, there are a few things uh, to, to try checking. Um, this formula does not hold in the year 50 because there's no king. It also doesn't hold in the year 2014 because there's no future. This model only had three, three years in it. So in that sense, it's not an adequate model. It, it illustrates something, but I really should have something there for each year. Um, so here's another example. 
Alice might have been taller than she is. I originally formulated it this way, uh, but this is not a legal formula. I have that A convey. So what we need to do is disambiguate the scope of the uh, height of Alice symbols. Uh, well, this is one way of doing it. It's, it's the way I showed you before. Uh, H of Z, the Z gets associated with the A, and so on. Um, so if you just unwrap this, it, it looks like the thing that I had before. But this is a legal formula. Uh, now you notice these two, this H and this A, uh, th this term is associated with the X, this is associated with the Z. So these two are inside the diamond. These two, this is associated with the Y, this is associated with the W, they're outside of that. All right, so again, here's a, here's a very simple model. Uh, we're not talking years now, we're talking how things are and how they might have been. So W1 is how things are, uh, and they could have been like W2. <coughs> Alice, and the domain I've got here is there's Alice, and there are heights. Uh, and I'm just using whole numbers from 0 to 400. That's entirely right. I'm interpreting uh, the A symbol here, the non-rigid Alice, who is actually rigid, as uh, this Alice object in both worlds, so that she is rigid. It's the real world, the alternative world. This is Alice, and these are heights and centimeters. Uh, I'm interpreting the greater than relation to be the same in both worlds. Uh, it's all ordered pairs where the x is a greater number than the y. So greater than symbol gets interpreted by greater than on the machinery we've got. Uh, the attention constant A designates everywhere. <coughs> it always designates Alice, so it's rigid. The function symbol H designates everywhere, but so it's supposed to designate a function. The function it designates at W1 assigns to Alice 165. The function h at w2 assigns to Alice 180. So the thing that maps Alice to her height is mapping it to 165 at w1 and to 180 at w2. All right. So that's non-rigid. So it's exactly what I was saying before. Um, Alice uh, is a rigid designator, but the height is a non-rigid attribute. Uh, I'll leave it to you to check that this uh, evaluates to true at one W1. Uh, you can take the next half a minute or so. Uh, um, this is a nice quote here. It's from Walden. He must be a great calculator indeed who succeeds. Simplify. Um, that, that formula is messier than it needs to be. It was the first thing that, that came to mind, but it's messier than it needs to be. If A is rigid, why do you have to have it twice there? Should they have the same meaning in both cases? But here we have it once inside, once outside. We could simplify it to this and get rid of one of the variables. Um, A that's associated with Z, which means the, the current value of A goes here and it also goes here. But the current value of A is also the same as in the alternative world. So Y evaluates H before you move to a possible world, and X evaluates H after you move to a possible world, both at A, which is the same no matter which. So this should behave like the other one. And it's a nice exercise. Um, I had something like this down before. Uh, I said if, uh, if A was rigid, You'd have something like this. Actually, this is what's called local rigidity. Uh, the usual definition of, ri of rigid uh, is it's the same in all worlds where it designates something. But you can have worlds here and worlds here, and you can't get from these to these. There's no path of accessibilities that will take you from here to here. And so there's no modal formula you can say that's true here that says anything about these worlds. So this is local rigidity. Uh, what it's saying is 
what A designates now, A will designate in any accessible world. So certainly, rigidity implies this. <coughs> and, uh, and, but this is weaker than full rigidity. But full rigidity is not quite what you want, because it involves talking about completely inaccessible worlds. But anyway, so this. Uh, so this is a, a good exercise. Um, suppose capital A is this first formulation that I had. Capital B is the second formulation. And this is a valid formula. If A is locally rigid, then capital A and capital B are equivalent, not just in that one model I showed you, but under all circumstances. As valid means true in all models. Now, you have to assume, you can assume the modal logic is K, which is the weakest of the normal modal logics, which means it will hold in any normal, normal logic. You have to assume equality is interpreted as the equality relation of all possible worlds. Okay, what about happiness? Well, for Alice and height, uh, we had a non-rigid map from persons to heights. I was assuming heights were numbers, and I had them 0 to 400. Uh, all right, that, 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 that got us going. Uh, but actually, all you need is that it's some linearly ordered entity. Any two heights can, can be compared. It um, doesn't have to be numbers. Um, and you, you can measure heights by putting somebody against the wall and drawing a line. And then you know what it means for somebody to be taller than somebody else. The line you get here is above the line you get here. And numbers don't actually come into it. It doesn't matter. You just need some kind of linear order. Um, in fact, usually when I say he's taller than she is, I don't have numbers in mind at all. I, I'm very bad at estimating heights. And I've done, I do know that for my own height, I'm usually looking up at people, but I don't really estimate numbers. Uh, what about degree of happiness? Well, it's a, what's, you, it should be some sort of partial ordering. Uh, a partial ordering, well, let's see, if A is bigger than B and B is bigger than C, A should be bigger than C. A should never be bigger than itself. But you don't necessarily uh, have the ability to compare any two things. Where A and B, A may not be bigger than B and B may not be bigger than A. Which seems to be quite appropriate for happiness. Uh, if this is ha if this person is happier than they, and they are happier than them, this is ha guy is happier than him. But these two, their happiness may be quite incompatible. They're happy in different ways. Uh, so, uh, well, that, that's a nice model. Uh, now. What about proof procedures? I've shown you uh, the syntax, I've shown you the semantics, and I probably don't have any time to do proof procedures in, in any plausible detail. But this predicate abstraction machinery has been axiomatized. Um, this is a paper of mine from some years ago. FOIL stands for First Order Intentional Logic. And this is actually a broader system than you've seen here. Um, it allows uh, relation symbols to hold not just of objects but of intentions. Uh, the pizza is here. Uh, of intentions. Uh, it has quantifiers in it, and quantifiers ranging over objects and quantifiers ranging over intentions. Everything you saw here can be formalized in it, but a lot more as well. Uh, there, there are what are called prefixed tableaus, uh, which you can find in the book I did with my colleague uh, Richard Mendelssohn. Uh, if you know semantic tableaus at all, prefixed tableaus are tableaus with some extra machinery that keeps track of possible worlds and does so syntactically. Uh, I said this was from a paper that hasn't been published yet, and this whole second half of the paper that I haven't discussed uh, gives what's called a nested sequence formulation. Are, you, are you, any of you familiar with nested sequence? OK, 
Okay. Well, it's it's spring, and the birds will be listing their sequence really shortly. <laughs> uh, now, look, the the idea is this: uh, Are you familiar with sequence calculus? Okay. So typically, in a sequence calculus, uh, you uh, you have a bunch of formulas, arrow a bunch of formulas. Uh, let me give you a loose idea first. Uh, in a nested sequence calculi, calculus, formulas and other sequence can appear in these places. So sequence can be nested within sequence. Now, as I just said, it, it can be simplified some. This is what's sometimes called a two-sided sequence. Well, an A on this side behaves like a not A on this side. A B on this side behaves like a not B on this side. So I can replace this by this. Um, and just give my rules as if only things on the right occurred. In which case, I don't really need the arrow. And this is what's called a one-sided sequence. Well, a one-sided sequence is just a set of formulas that you remember the way things are on the rights of arrows. They're interpreted by borders. So it's this or this or this or this. So if you, if you understand that, you can easily give rules for one-sided calculi. Uh, well, so a sequence, one-sided, is just a set of formulas with the commas and, uh, understood disjunctive. Uh, a nested sequence, uh, one-sided sequence, is a set of formulas and nested sequence. So this is a set. Would be an essence. For an ordinary sequence, uh, uh, if you have this, it should be taken as an axiom. Remember, this is a big disjunction, and everything is on the right of the arrow. And you've got something in it's going to be. For a nested sequence, it's an axiom if A and not A occur at any level. So that would count as an axiom. Uh, the rules, you know, for ordinary sequence, in nested sequence, apply at any given uh, depth of nesting. But how do you interpret this, what, what nesting means? Think of this as saying you have this or this or this or this or necessarily this or this or necessarily this. Every time you move down the level, it's necessitated. Once you understand that, then it's not too hard to come up with uh, modal rules for nested sequence. Uh, you may be familiar with the fact that uh, the sequence calculus and the Tableau systems are really the same thing. One is the other upside down. Well, nested sequence and prefixed Tableau uh, systems are the same thing. One is the other upside down. So anyway, so there's a nested sequence formulation for this. And I need to give a credit here. Uh, this talk is based on a paper. And I don't mean the paper that I wrote that hasn't appeared yet. Uh, I grew out of hearing uh, a talk by Kai Weimeyer in 2010, he gave a talk at City University uh, called Subjunctivity and Cross-World Predication. It was exactly this kind of issue. How do you handle making a statement about somebody under present circumstances and somebody other, under other circumstances? And his way of handling it was to have predicates that didn't, where the places weren't just filled by what they were in a world, but across worlds. So it moved the whole burden of the thing to the machinery of the, the relation symbols. Uh, well, that got me thinking about things, and I thought this would be a nice way of doing it. And I kind of think, but I, I never have verified it, that what he did can be embedded in what I did, but not the other way around. But uh, where do you call Because I have this upside down, I'm going backwards. Uh, but anyway, that hasn't been verified, and that's really as far as it goes. So that's the end of the talk. Thank you.